Would you help me to say a big hello to our Bell Chase campus worshiping with us live right now? We love you guys. I love that we can, what we can do with technology is amazing these days, that we can worship in two places together at the same time, study God's word together. We love Bell Chase. We love the city of New Orleans and all that God is doing here. I want to give all of you a big shout out because there's a lot going on in our city for being in church and making it a priority as a family to be here. Online is beautiful. It's a great thing, but there's so much, it's so much better, right? And you get to shake somebody's hand, you get to hug somebody's neck, you get to have a little coffee in church. Come on, all right? I always say like this, highly caffeinated people enjoy Jesus more, okay? And so we've got a great time prepared for you. If you've been following along with us in this recent season, just last week after Easter, we kicked off a new series that we simply titled, Help! Help! Because I think... We all need it, whether we'd like to admit it or not. When I was in school growing up, I never wanted to be the kid who asked the question, but I was always really thankful for the kid that did ask the question because I learned off the backs of everybody else's questions. Amen, everybody. And, and, and so for Easter, we asked, we gave you a little survey, said, hey, tell us, tell us what you uh, would be most helpful to you. And today, uh, I'm happy to report to you that there were a lots of areas you're like, help this, help this. But the, the four or five top, are you interested in knowing? Let me tell you to you. The four or five top, the first was purpose. I just want to know uh, what, I'm, what I'm here for. And so last week, and even a portion of today's message is going to help you to discover and understand purpose. The highest one of all of them was anxiety. I feel overwhelmed. Today's uh, subject matter is help. I'm overwhelmed. All right, that's where we are. Uh, what was interesting to me is the number of you that said, I need help with money, trying to figure things out. I'm nervous about money and what to do, and we're going to try to help you there. And then the other, which I'm so excited, so proud of you, that so many of you said, I, I want more of the Bible. I need to, I like, want to understand and study the Bible. And so, Right after this series, we're beginning a, a lengthy, probably going to be about seven-week series on studying the Bible and helping you to understand the, the very foundation of Christian doctrine. Doctrine is one of those words where we're going to explain and make sense for some of you who may be new to this. But there are some foundational things that we believe. And when you say, I'm a Christian, after this series, you're going to be able to say, I know what it means to be a Christian. We're calling this series Deep Thoughts with Pastor Josh. I'm just kidding. I'm not with Pastor Just Deep Thoughts, all right? It, it, some of you are familiar with Saturday Night Live. You know what joke I just made right there. Some of you young people are like, what's Saturday Night Live? Okay, it's, it's all right. It's a thing. You know, it's a thing. Uh, today, uh, as we jump into part two, we have a key verse for the series. I'm going to ask everyone in the room, Bell Chase here in Paris Avenue, Psalm 46.1. Would you read it aloud with me? It says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. It's a very simple verse. I'm asking you to memorize it. Because God is a refuge, he is a strength, and he is ever-present help. He is always there. You are never alone. You may feel alone. You may think you're alone. Somebody may have said, I don't want you. But let me just tell you today, God wants you. God loves you. And he loves helping everybody. And listen, I like people's help, but God's help is even better, right? And so today, we're going to lean into finding help from God and uh, it's in this season, though, that I do want to say today's message, if, you're, if you leave today and say, I, I need more of this, today's message is one that I'm pulling from a series I did in 2022 called The Struggle is Real, where for five weeks I talked about the subject matter we're going to talk about today. And I would encourage you, if anxiety and stress and fear and even trauma is, a, is a, just a continual thing that you're, you're fine, I can't overcome, go back archives onehopechurch.com will help you to kind of process and learn what the Bible actually says about these things. Now, today we're most often overwhelmed because life is out of control. I don't know if your life looks like mine. I've got two teenagers right now. We've got sports. We've got basketball. We've got volleyball. And can I just tell you, those coaches think that they run our lives. I recently wanted to pull one of them aside and said, would you stop trying to tell me where to be every night of the week? But they, they think that whatever they're doing is their passion, and I get it. It's how I feel about Jesus. But if I told you guys you had to be somewhere four nights a week and the weekend, y'all would look at me and say, Pastor, you're crazy. But we do it in this world because we, we think our child is going to be that third of a percent. That's what it is, a third of a percent that they're actually going to make it in professional sports. I hate to break it to some of y'all. Uh, you're going to have a great high school career. That's what you're going to have. And you may want your knees for later, okay? 
Uh, we're overwhelmed because we, we're, we're chasing after all sorts of things and we're reacting to the craziness of our society, kind of like Karate Kid. We're trying to wax this on, we're trying to wax that off, we're trying to fight this off, we're trying to make it in every situation, work, family, pre kid pressure. And, and then some of you don't have a family, but you're desiring your family, so are desiring kids, and then that's pressure. Everywhere you turn, there is a bit of chaos in our world. And today I just want to say right here early in the message that Christianity, Christians, are called to bring order to the chaos of the world. Amen. Very first thing God did when he created man and woman, he says, go, go get something, get this stuff in order. And we know when sin entered the world, it brought great disorder to our world. So most of the chaos that's driving us is, is rooted in things that are not godly. But we as Christians, we don't have to live that way. Amen, everybody? We're called to see the kingdom of God be present in our lives even now. So we don't have to live and flow and go that way. When we're moving too fast and we're letting the chaos drive us, we increase four things. You might want to write them down. You're going to write them down multiple times today. We increase four things. Fear anxiety, stress, and trauma in our lives. We increase the amount of it that's in our lives, and then because we're moving so fast, we're not even taking time to deal with yesterday's anxiety, so today's anxiety is just stacked on yesterday's problems, and then, and then because we didn't deal with yesterday's and today's, tomorrow's are on there, and we haven't even talked about the thing that I'm really afraid of, and, and then the work prep, like, so it just all stacks, and then we feel as though, well, how can I survive all this? Well, today, I've got good news for you. You can. You can live a life free from, I won't say ever having fear, free from ever having anxiety, but you'll know what to do with those things and why God allowed them to be a part of our lives. You see, the enemy has tried to hijack what God intended to be our, our biological warning systems. He's tried to hijack these things to use them as weapons against us. And, and so we're labeling ourselves by our fear, by our anxiety, by our stress, by our trauma, rather than stepping back and saying, no, 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 those were things that God put in our lives to help us to process those things. You've got some pretty amazing warning systems. The first one is fear. Fear is supposed to be a healthy part of your life. Fear isn't supposed to overwhelm you. It's supposed to protect you. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. If you're swimming across St. John's Bayou, a healthy fear keeps an eye out for the alligators. Amen, everybody? Healthy fear says, I'm swimming, but I'm looking too, right? But unhealthy fear says, I can't get in any water anywhere because there may be an alligator in the swimming pool. Some of, some of you young people know what I'm talking about. You see water, you immediately associate it with fear. Why? Because at some point you didn't process what was supposed to be healthy fear. Like, you know, when you're up high in a tree or walking really, and there's no railing, your body is saying to you, be careful, you might fall. That's healthy, but unfortunately, because we've not dealt with those things in a, and, and learned how to process them, we've allowed it to kind of cascade into bigger things. When you're dealing with fear, uh, it always leads to a what-if question. Write this down. Let me fear. Ask the question, what if this happens? Write it down. Every, every fear is your mind playing the cycle of what if this goes on? What if I crash? What if, what, what if they can't? My son is going to driving school in a few weeks. <laughs> we got some what ifs about that, can I tell you? you know? <laughs> what if I lose my job? Fear, quite often, that becomes debilitating is based upon an old definition that one of my mentors gave me. Fear is false evidence appearing real. It's a little bit of a lie wrapped up in a little bit of a truth to try and get you to believe the lie rather than the truth, but it's false evidence that's trying to get you to go the wrong way. What should you do if you're facing fear? Well, you, you have to answer the what ifs. You've got to sit down and say, I'm afraid of this, but what if that happens? Can I tell you today, if you're deathly afraid of losing your job, it will not be the end of your life. But some of us think, if I lose my job, we won't be, oh, how am I going to make it? Listen, God is a provider, everybody. And you've got to speak truth to that. It, so the answer, write it down, the answer to fear is to speak truth to the false evidence appearing real. Well, where do you find that truth? Well, it's in the Word of God. 
that you've you got to have a source to go to because you don't know where the lie is unless you know what the truth is. And if you've always been taught a lie, then you're going to live in that over and over again. So 2 Timothy 1, 7, come on, says God, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but what did he give us? Power, love, and a sound mind. You want to defeat fear, you need the power of God, the love of God, and a sound mind. Can I say it again for somebody in the back? You need the power of God that you believe in. You need the love of God to know that he would not forget you, leave you, or forsake you. And you need to get that in your mind so that when the alligator swims by, you say, God's got this, right? God God has got this. He's, he's in. <laughs> By the way, I did that one time as, when I was a kid. When I, when I was a, my, my older brother was four years older, and he was always getting me into trouble. Always. Some of you older brothers know what I'm talking about. One day we were walking along the levee because we lived right off the Mississippi River, right by the levee, and, and it was getting dark, and we noticed that there was an alligator in the little, like, little waterway, and my brother's like, we're going to go catch this alligator. And I was just like, I was a young, stupid child is what I was. And I said, sounds like fun. Let's go do it. Next thing you know, I'm holding a flashlight, and my brother's straddling the ditch, and, and he's like, just hold him there. Hold, blind him with the light. <laughs> he reaches down, and he pulls out a three-foot alligator. If you ever want to know what the devil looks like, <laughs> pull an alligator out of the ditch. If that wasn't enough, we carried that thing home. He held the head. I held the tail. Come on. Got my, I got some smarts in this deal. We got all the way home, and he said, you know, I, I heard somewhere that alligators have great closing strength, but, but terrible opening strength, and we taped the alligator's mouth, and we had at that time in our family an above-ground pool, and we put that alligator in the above-ground pool, and it just started swimming, and we were like, hey, it looks good. We swam with an alligator. This is what you can do with your fear <laughs> if you will trust God. Fear is a healthy warning system when you're dealing with sharks and alligators and heights and, hey, be careful. Your body tells you you should beware. That, that's good. That's normal. We're not trying to do away with that. God intended you to do that. But when it becomes debilitating and it's based upon a half-truth or a lie, that's not what God wants for you. And you've got to speak to that. You've got to say to yourself, if I tape the mouth, we'll be okay. I'm just kidding. Don't do that, right? Right? The second thing that we face with, and I've got to keep moving here because I want to hit all four of them to help you to just have a beginning framework of what to do with each of them. Much like fear, anxiety is supposed to be an internal alarm system. It's your body telling you this is important. Like a football player standing on the sideline waiting to get into the game, your body starts to get excited. Your body starts saying, we're about to do something important. We're about to do something important. And then what our society has said is when you feel that, you should run away. And so we're running away from the most important things when your body is actually rising to the occasion. And so I never say I'm anxious. I always say, I can't wait to do this. Listen, there's not a single Sunday I sit over there and I think, God, if you don't go up there with me, I can't go, one. Number two, God, if you want somebody else to do this, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> Some of y'all think that's not true. I'm, I'm called to do what God's called me to do, and I, or, but the day God says it's time to pass the baton, I'll, be, I'll happily hand that baton. Why? Because this is not about me. This is about Jesus. Amen, everybody? So I have anxiety every single Sunday. If I term it the way the world terms it, but I don't term it that way, I say, oh, here we go. We're about to do something great. Literally, we're in the, in the office with the worship team praying over the worship set and praying over you and preparing. So today we're bringing, we're bringing order to an area of chaos. Can you feel it? And I looked at him and I said, listen, I, one of the things I love about doing this is I get to stand in a room with a circle of people and say, I'm not doing this by myself. You realize that, that the camera operators have prayed for you today and the guy behind the soundboard has prayed for you today and the production booth who you never see because they live in a cave back there. Come on, it's like television in there. If you've never peeked in the room, it's pretty amazing, right? What do they do? They prayed for you today and they are as anxious about those kind of computer working as I am. But what do they do? They lean in and say, God created me for this. Do you understand what I'm doing here, Right? I'm taking what God intended you to have and defining it the way God defined it rather than defining it as something that you can't overcome. 
You don't have to label yourself as anxious. Anxiety, ask the question, you got to ask this question, write it down with me. What is causing this feeling? An example might be if your boss is always mistreating you and maybe verbally dressing you down and cursing at you and you're afraid, you're feeling anxious about that conversation. Well, you need to address the situation. Answer, here's the answer. Address the situation. Or if you're just anxious because you have a presentation, you need to reframe your feeling. If it is something that is wrong that is causing anxiety like Like you haven't stayed within budget the last three months, your financial budget, and you're starting to dig a hole and you're anxious about the next month starting, well, then you need to address the situation. Amen, everybody? You need to get in a financial small group and learn some healthy business principles that maybe should have been taught to all of us when we were in high school, right? And go back, address this. But then you may actually start doing the right things and find that you're anxious and you're doing all the right things. What do you need to do? Reframe. I need to reframe what's going on in my heart and mind and say, no, no, this is what God intends. God wants me to be excited. God wants me to be passionate about this. God wants my, my body to respond to the challenge that's in front of me. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 4. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He said that he can, that he can handle any anxious situation you have going on. I always, whenever I read that, when he says, do not be anxious about anything, I'm like, Do y'all realize that anything covers everything? Everything. You don't have to live an anxious life. It's interesting to me how preparing for certain messages, how I'll live the message that week. It can be challenging at times. Because like, this is why we don't do very many marriage seminars, because I have a great marriage. Except for the week of a marriage seminar. We will fight more times that week preparing to talk to people about marriage than we will the rest of the year. So whenever our team says, hey, it's time to do that, I'm like, Lord Jesus, I have anxiety, okay? Sometimes I live the message that I'm preparing to preach, and literally this morning, 3.30, eyes opened up. And something that I went to sleep knowing was there before I went to sleep, and I went straight to sleep, didn't even bother me, but 3.30 in the morning, it's like, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about this? So normally what I do right there is I say to myself, this is foolishness. I reframe, and I pray, and I give it to God quickly, and I roll over. Amen, everybody? But then sometimes it comes back. Anybody have that? And then 15 minutes later, you're staring at the ceiling. What do you do with that? Well, then I get up, and I deal with it, y'all. So I got up for about an hour. I went and worked on the thing that was kind of had my mind spinning right there. And then my mind relaxed and I went back to bed. I missed about an hour in the middle of the night. I think it's your fault. <laughs> I think it's this message's fault. I'm not saying that there isn't anything that ever gets me up or anything that doesn't make me anxious. But I address it and I reframe it. You need to write that down somewhere. I address it and I reframe it. I change my speaking about it. I am not anxious about this. I'm excited. I'm passionate. Look at what God is doing in our church. Right? It's amazing. You have to reframe your words because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if your mouth is constantly saying negative things that are half-truths and lies, then that's the cycle you're going to live. So you've got to get enough truth in to say, no, 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 no. God, God's got this. We're going to make it. You, you, so you deal with your fear, right? And you have to deal with them individually and actually understand which is which. Then you begin to deal with the anxiety that's there and, and you, you kind of put it in its right place. But fear and anxiety are similar. But then we get to the third one, which is stress. Fear and anxiety are similar, but stress is slightly different because stress is what we feel when we're carrying something heavy. I don't know if you've worked out lately, but... Part of working out usually is is about picking up something heavy for short amounts of time. But every weightlifter knows that you're not supposed to carry that dumbbell around all week. Amen, everybody? 
You're supposed to carry it for short bursts of time to strengthen yourself so that the other things you carry in the week, you're stronger for them. You're not supposed to carry the dumbbell all week. Y'all following this? Here's what happens to us is we start feeling the weight of our kids, the weight of our jobs, financial stress, the weight of our futures, the weight of our society, the weight of the presidential election, and what are we going to do? And those keep stacking, and it's like putting one more dumbbell in, one more pound in, one more dumbbell in, and, and then you're like, I'm going to make it, but then you're, you're literally hunched over backwards because the backpack is so heavy. There is, there is something to carrying things for a short amount of time to teach yourself how to get stronger so that you can carry other things. But you aren't supposed to just keep stacking more and more weights on top of your shoulder. You're actually supposed to say, okay, this is a weight. Oh, that's important, but that goes right there. That's a weight, but that goes right here. You are not meant to carry the weight of the world. We weren't designed for constant internal pressure and external weight. In the Old Testament times of your Bible, whenever they wanted to torture and to even get to the point of actually killing someone for something, one of the forms of torture they had is they would, they would put you in a place and they would begin to stack rocks against you and on top of you. And, and literally to the point, they would just keep stacking more and more to the point of crushing you where you couldn't breathe to eventually you died from the weight. Can you see the enemy's plan? He can't do it in one, in one shot. So he's just going to keep stacking a little here and a little there and a little here and a little there. So when dealing with stress, what should you ask? It's a simple question. Should I be carrying this weight right now? Now, there are times to carry weight. So you're hearing this. There are times that you are designed by God to carry those weights. A little over 11 years ago, my older brother passed away. It was terrible. It was overwhelming. It was fear-inducing and, and anxiety-building. All those things were around that. But in the moment, my father asked if I would be able to lead the service that day because he couldn't. And, and I understood being in a pastor's family, you, you want to lead your own sons or your own brothers. I was like, you can do it. He said, no, 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 you're doing it. And I went to bed that night feeling a lot of stress, feeling a lot of pressure. And I woke up the next morning and I went to God and I gave him that fear and that anxiety and that stress. And the message that God gave me that day is a message that I have now preached for 11 years at almost every funeral service I've ever been to. And it came out of one of the heaviest moments of my life. But God gave me the strength beforehand to carry that weight. Y'all hearing this today? You are strong enough to carry the weight you have to carry. You just need to not carry it nonstop. Should I be carrying this weight right now? Should I be carrying this weight at all? Here's the answer. You should offload stress by giving it to God first, then rest. Every day, there's this beautiful thing called sleep. Your cell phone has been stealing hours of it, and it might be time for you to steal it back. Amen, everybody? But you know when you sleep, that you sleep best, most of us, in, in a lying down, in a prone position, in a lying down, why? Where you're literally carrying no weight, even on your legs, you're, you're, you're completely relaxed. There is something about handing problems to God and then resting. If you're feeling overwhelmed right now, a change of pace and a change of place will likely change your perspective. Can I say it again? A change of pace and a change of place will change your perspective. Slow down, rest, offload some stuff, and it will change your life. Psalm 118 verse 5 says, In my distress I prayed to the Lord. And what did the Lord do? He left me out there by myself? No, no, no. And the Lord answered me and what? And set me free. The weight you're carrying, you don't have to carry. You don't have to even carry your past sin. Amen, everybody? Praise God, I don't have to carry the weight of my mistakes from the past. I can just deal with what's happening today not in the notes but Jesus even said like listen don't worry about tomorrow each day has enough trouble on its own like all you've got is grace for today amen everybody 
And so you need to live in today. Fear, anxiety, stress, when they're out of control, it kind of keeps us doing the same things, right? The chaos creeps in, and we start living based upon the fear, living based upon the anxiety, living based upon... So we're just living in this crazy cycle, but we want to get off, don't we? We want to get off that track. How do you do that? Well, you can't keep doing the same thing you've been doing. The fear, anxiety, and stress is just going to create more fear, anxiety, and stress. You've got you to get off the train, amen? What do they say? The, old, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. I love that. At some point, we have to change what we're doing in order to change the result in our life. People who don't deal with fear, anxiety, and stress are more likely to cause trauma or be the recipients of trauma. Can I say it one more time? People who don't deal with their issues, it's the old adage, hurt people, what do they do? They hurt people. But you know what healthy people do? They heal people. So today, I, I don't want you to continue to live as a hurt person. I want you to continue to live as, as a healthy person so that you can bring healing to your family so that what you're giving your children isn't fear, anxiety, stress, and trauma. This is what's happened genera generationally because we've not dealt with the chaos of our world, so we're creating more and more and more of it. And then we've created a device that has you look at that over and over and over again. It used to be you had to wait till 5 o'clock in the evening, come on, some of you people, like to watch the news to be stressed out about the war, right? Now you just, you wake up in the morning and you open a device and it's like, alert, alert, Iran is just done, right? What do you do with that? Well, you've got to answer, you've got to refrain, you've got to ask yourself, what's your responsibility? You've got to, you're following this. You make a couple of decisions, and then I say, okay, well, today, in this moment, my responsibility in regard to the issue that's going on in the Middle East is to pray and to vote. Y'all hearing this? So I'm prayerfully preparing myself to vote on who I think might help us to prevent furthering World War III. Y'all, can, can I go there? All right, I'm going to stop now because I'm stressing y'all out. I can tell some of y'all like, don't go there. But this is what we do with real stress. This is how we create order out of chaos. And this is your calling as a Christian. The last one, number four, trauma. Trauma, unlike the first three, is an emotional response to a deeply disturbing or distressing event. When we think of trauma, most people think it's the event. But technically speaking, trauma is the response to what happened to you. Listen, all of us, many of us, have had traumatic experiences. Your response really determines what you're able to do with that. And in our culture, we've taught that the best way to respond is to now deem yourself a victim and live as a victim. Today, I need you to hear me clearly. That is contrary to how God says you should respond to the trauma of our world. He actually says you should allow him to use it for good so that you can become a victorious person, that you take, you become an example of like when that happens, this is what God will do. You're hearing this. Then our lives and our worst experiences become a testimony of how God took what would make one a victim and made us victorious. You're hearing this. So trauma, you have to ask this question, am I living a victorious life or as a victim? Every time you think of something or think about what happened to you, does that spiral into a, a definition of your identity? This is who I am. This is what happened. See, there's, there's something different to say that happened and then God healed me. That's beautiful. To say that happened and now that's who I am is a very dangerous place to be. You are not your worst day. Amen, everybody? You are not your worst sin, and you're not what the worst sin someone else ever committed to you. That's not what defines you today. You have the power through the, the, the gospel to change and accept what, how God has defined you. So what do you have to do if you have had an experience that has caused trauma in your life? Here's the answer. You do need to get professional help spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Do not deal with that on your own. 
Do not stuff it down and act like it's not there. There are times... Listen, if you had a broken arm, every one of you would say, I'm running to, I got, look, my arm's pointing the wrong direction. I'm going to the doctor. Why is it when, when our brain is pointing the wrong direction because of trauma response, we think we don't need a doctor? Come on, one of you wanted to clap over there. Somebody needs to clap right there, right? You need, a, you need, a, you need help. Proverbs 15, 22, listen, listen, listen. It says, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. If you're feeling disappointed because of how you've gone through life, it may be that you need someone, a small group leader, a pastor, a doctor, a therapist, someone that's, that has, has a healthy marriage to come along and help your marriage. Maybe you need them in your life. When we allow the chaos to define our lives, it increases fear, anxiety, stress, and trauma. We get more and more of it. Why do we experience so much of this? Well, today you experience it because you have an incredible purpose to live for, and the enemy does not want you to live for that purpose. And if he can get you overwhelmed with fear, anxiety, stress, and trauma, he can keep you from that purpose. You may be a Christian today who's going to heaven, but based upon how you're living, you're, you're limping your way there. And that, if he can't keep you from heaven, then he wants to make you an ineffective Christian. The enemy wants to use your fear, anxiety, stress, and trauma to keep you from God's purpose. But today, you're tougher than that. And your purpose is tougher. We say it around here that our purpose is to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference with our lives. That's our clear purpose. We find that in Ephesians chapter 1. I love how the message translation says it. It says, I ask the God of our master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally. Hey, I want your eyes to be focused and clear so that you can see exactly what it is he's calling you to do and to grasp the immensity of his glorious way of life he has for his followers. God wants to know you personally. He wants to help you find freedom. He wants your eyes focused and clear. He wants you to discover that there's a reason you're sucking air today, right? There's a purpose for your existence, and then he wants you to live that out. He wants you to feel that fulfillment. Every one of us today is under that same umbrella of purpose. Some are fathers, some are mothers, some are teachers, some are doctors, some are managers, some are owners. Some of us are trying to be influencers. I don't even know if that's a career these days, but it seems like it is. But here, here's the deal. Regardless of what it is, you have a purpose, and the enemy wants you to get lost in the other, going so crazy in the chaos that you live there. It's a beautiful story in the Old Testament of your Bible about the, the prophet Ezekiel, the Bible tells us that Ezekiel was called by God to engage and to deal with the chaos that was happening with his people. And because I am short on time, I'm going to go right to the story. In chapter 1, God gives Ezekiel a vision of who God is so that he can get to know God. In chapter 2, God calls Ezekiel to a specific role. Here's what he says. He says, I'm sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God, as for them, whether they listen or not, whether they are, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them, and you, son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words. Though thistles and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a modern, can I modernize that? Though you have fear, anxiety, stress, and trauma. He says, though you sit on these things, neither fear their words, nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house. But you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. Sounds like our society right now, doesn't it? He says, now you son of man, listen to what I'm speaking for you to do. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I'm giving to you. Then I looked and behold, a hand was extended to me and lo, a scroll was in the hand. A scroll represents the word of God. It's truth that will set you free. When he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back and it was written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. God was judging them for how they were living. It's a challenging verse. And God says, Ezekiel, this is your purpose. I want you to go speak order to the chaos that's happening in the world. 
Can I just say to you today that every one of us, regardless of what your job is, regardless of what your career is, as a Christian, we are called to bring order to the chaos of the world. You are called to be a mouthpiece for God. You are called to, in little ways and big ways, to make a difference with your life. You don't have to do it all, praise God. We can do it together. So God calls Ezekiel to do this. And I don't know if you've noticed what Ezekiel noticed, but, but sometimes people are hard to be around. I mean, literally, the Lord compares them to thistles, thorns, and scorpions. Anybody have a friend that's a thistle, a thorn, or a scorpion? This is what they're dealing with. But in the, re- the last few chapters, as you read through the book of Ezekiel and his life and how he presses into his calling, we discover four truths that I think that today you can walk away with. Four truths that I need you to say today as you leave, that this is God's word to you. Would you write them down with me, number one? Today I need you to understand that God made you strong. You are not weak. You are not a victim. You are not going to be defeated. God is on your side. At one point, God asked Ezekiel to do something hard, and Ezekiel's like, man, these people are hard-headed. In Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, Behold, behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like Emory, you're harder than Flint. I made your forehead. (laughs) I love the Bible, don't y'all? Do not be afraid of them or be dismayed before them, though they are a rebellious house. I love this. God says, I made you harder than them. I made you stronger than the fear you've been dealing. I made you stronger than the anxiety of the world. I made you stronger than what they said or what happened to you. You are stronger. I made you that way. Listen, we start every workout Saturday morning, 9 a.m., saying we are going to do this because God made you strong and we're going to get stronger. We declare it every night. I pray over my children I, a simple prayer. Lord, I thank you for my child. I pray that he or she will have a good night's rest, that you will help them to be a strong man or woman of God. I pray that you will fill them with the Holy Spirit and that tomorrow will be a great day. Almost every day, I pray this prayer over my children. They are strong. You are strong. Here's the second. Write it down with me. Number two, God God made you not only strong, but God made you resilient. You may have been knocked down, but you are not out. Amen, everybody? Listen, I I know I'm not T.D. Jakes, but I see him right now preaching. Can you see him? Can you see him right now? Like, I know I just, I look just like him, don't I, right? I just... I just, I need you to stir something on the inside of you that says, listen, yesterday was a bad day, but today is going to be better. You are resilient. And this is one of the things I love about New Orleans. Man, we we have been through some stuff. I'm born and raised here. My great-great-grandparents came over on a boat from Sicily to the port of New Orleans, grew up in the Ninth Ward. Right? I, I got family that's been here for a long We're a city that has faced some hardship, and God has always been on our side. Ezekiel 3 says this. He says, Moreover, God said to him, Son of man, take into your heart all my words which I will speak to you and listen closely. You need to take this into your heart right now. You need to eat the scroll. You need to stop looking at the Word of God as kind of like this a great self-help book. You need to come back to the Word of God and say, No, no, it's what I need. It's sustenance for my soul. If only Kay played like the organist for T.D. Jake's church. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't think I have that kind of risk. Come on, everybody. God made you strong. God made you resilient. Charles Spurgeon said, We are prone as a people to engrave our trials in marble and write our blessings in sand. Today, it's time to flip the script. You are strong. You are resilient. It's time to write the truth of, it's time to engrave it on your heart. You can get up. I sense, can I just lean in just for a moment? Some of you have even, you're here, 
and you're like, this might be my last time. I, I gotta, I'm going to try a church one more time because my last church, this, it went, let's listen, we are not those people. We didn't do those things today. Will you open your heart for God to meet you in a special way? Will you open your heart? Listen, we're imperfect just like other people. But if you give us a shot, we'll own our imperfection. We'll say we're sorry. We'll get better. We'll do better. Y'all hear this today? I just sense the Holy Spirit that there's this hurt. There's this angst. There's this thing you're holding on to. Listen, can I just say it? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what happened. I'm so, sorry for what they did. I'm sorry for how it went down. But, but now it's time to get up. It's time to, to live and be who God intended you to be. If you're feeling depressed, it's time to get close to God, to slow things down, to sleep a little bit, to work out a little bit, to get healthy again. It's time to get back up so you can recharge the hill. It's time for you to go again. Number three, God not only made you strong and resilient, God made you successful already. In our American culture, success is so much driven by the wrong thing. Listen, you're a child of the Most High God. When I look at my children, they're already successful. Why? Because they're made in my image. Come on, everybody. Right? I'm just kidding. Just laugh at me. Just laugh. Just laugh. They're made in the image of God. Exodus 3.11 says, Go to the exiles, to the sons of your people, and speak to them and tell them whether they listen or not, you know, if you do the right thing, whether they change or not, God says you did the right thing. And in God's eyes, you are successful doing what God called you to do. Not everything is going to change, not everyone. Why? Because God gave us the ability to make choices, each of us. But here's what you need to remember. If you make the right choice, God says, well done, well done, well done. Here's the last. I need to close. Number four, God made you for a purpose. Ezekiel 3.14, so the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And it uses this word, I went embittered in the rage of my spirit, and the hand of the Lord was strong on me. I call this a holy discontent. He had a righteous anger. There was something that welled up, not to, not to do harm to others, not to get vengeance for others, but there was something that welled up in Ezekiel and said, we've got to right the ship. We've got to change. We've got to fix this. And there are some things in me. I need you to know. There are some things shut up in my bones that are just, they're ready to get out. There are some things that need to change in our city. The violence has to stop, right? The anger has to stop. The murder has to stop. We've got to get past our fear, anxiety, stress, and trauma so that we can engage where God has called us. You're strong enough to do it. You are resilient. You are successful. And this is our purpose. This is our calling. You're never going to be happy outside of the purpose of God, so you might as well, as a Christian, go after it. Amen, everybody? There's this deal. There's this deal with God. If you know better and don't do better, He's not going to let you be happy knowing but not doing. He's going to challenge you. Here's our closing verse. For we know that we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Right down the last verse, would you bow with me all around this room, every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment of reflection and prayer. If you're here today and you find yourself far from God, this is your moment to get close. The Bible is amazing. And the saving grace of God is amazing. All you have to do to experience his saving grace is reach out to him in faith. The Bible says that it's the grace of God that saves us, and all you have to do is in faith invite God in. Today, for whatever reason, if you find yourself far from God and you want to have a personal relationship with Jesus, would you whisper these words? I'll give them to you, but you be honest. You say them in faith. Say, Lord Jesus... I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.